Good morning, Center Church. It's great to be with you today. I'm excited that you've joined us for our online worship service. I want to especially say welcome to those who are visitors to our church or maybe have never been to our church in person. We're glad you're with us on this stream today. Um, as we get started, I want to make a couple of quick announcements. We are collecting for Operation Christmas Child, collecting shoe boxes full of gifts. Uh, you can find the instructions on how to do that online very easily, uh, but we would invite you to bring those by the church if you are planning to give one. The deadline is November the 8th, I believe. Also, want to begin promoting another event we're having at this church. Yesterday, we had the drive through Fall Festival. At the time of recording, we haven't actually had it yet, so I'm just going to assume that that went really well. Um, but as a follow-up to that event, we are doing a s'mores and movie night, a family s'mores and movie night uh, here on the property of the church outside. We're going to project a movie. We're going to watch Frozen 2, which has kind of a fall theme. And we are asking that members of the church would participate, uh, come out, bring lawn chairs and blankets and watch the movie with us. But also we're hoping that we can have church members bring the s'mores supplies. So we need marshmallows, we need chocolate and graham crackers and those types of things. And uh, Julie, our church administrator, is going to send out a sign-up list. So if that's something that interests you, we would love for you to uh, join in and participate that way. It'll be November the 14th, Saturday at 6 p.m. Uh, we hope everybody comes. It should be a fun time. With those things, uh, we're going to now move into our call to worship. This is Reformation Sunday. It's the Sunday every year that we celebrate the Reformation, uh, the beginning of the Protestant church, but really the continuation of the Spirit's working in the church to constantly reform, constantly bring us back to Christ. And so in light of that, the call to worship this morning is from Jeremiah chapter 31. Um, we're going to read the promise of God's Spirit in the New Covenant and let that lead us into worship. Jeremiah 31, it says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No more will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Let's worship the Lord together.
Pray with me. God, we are grateful for the opportunity to worship you. We're grateful that you are a mighty fortress for us. Lord, that we can run to you and find shelter. And that you will never fail us. And Lord, we come to you this morning in worship and ask that you would let that truth sink down to our hearts today. God, that you would draw us into true worship, that we would not be just going through the motions, but instead, Lord, that, that you would transform our hearts, our minds, our entire lives by the power of your Spirit. Lord, we pray that also for those who come this morning looking for truth, for those who don't know you, those who have been have stumbled across this stream somehow, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to them especially this morning. God, we pray these things the way you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as we mentioned a few moments ago, this is Reformation Sunday. It's the Sunday that we are uh, celebrating and remembering uh, the beginning of the Reformation when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the front door in Wittenberg. Um, that began... Uh, a new movement of the Spirit. It began a, a revitalization of the church that has continued to this day and the work that we must, as Christ's followers, continue to this day. The work of constantly bringing people back to the truth of Scripture and to the truth of, of the doctrines of grace. Um, those things are often summarized in the five solas. The five solas is a term used to designate the five foundational rallying cries of the Protestant Reformation. And this is what they are. This is, they are sola scriptura, which is scripture alone, sola gratia, which is grace alone, sola fide, which is faith alone, solus Christus, which is Christ alone, and soli deo gloria, which means to God alone be glory. Those statements, they served as a corrective to the medieval church that had fallen into a state of corruption during the beginnings of the Reformation period. But today, they summarize the core beliefs of the Protestant church. And so today, we're going to have a responsive reading uh, in the place where we normally do the Apostles' Creed. And we're essentially going to read portions of Scripture that uplift, uh, that highlight these doctrines. And so as we do that, as we read this together, let's also give thanks in our heart for the living God who is constantly reforming his church and reforming our lives through the power of his word. So if you'll read along with me, we'll have these on the screen for you. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. I will bow down toward your holy temple, and I will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted all things, above all things, your name and your word. Psalm 138, 2. Solus Christus, Christ alone. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have 
supremacy. Colossians 1, 13 through 18. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6. Sola gratia, grace alone. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Ephesians 1, 7 through 8. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? Romans 5, 15. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. So la fide, faith alone. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Romans 5, 1 through 2. Soli Deo Gloria, glory to God alone. So whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father, to be to him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Revelation 1, 6. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Please join us as we sing this next song.
We'll now move into our time of pastoral prayer. This is a moment for us to pray together, not just for you to listen to me pray, but for us to intercede uh, on behalf of our brothers and sisters in Christ and know that uh, at this moment, many of us are at the church praying along with you. Um, At this moment, people are spread around the city and perhaps around the country and the world praying along with you. So let's join together in this time of prayer. God, thank you for the gift of your spirit. Thank you that you're a living God, that you are not a God who is written in the books of history, who wound up the clock and then walked away and let the world operate on its own, but you are the one in whom we live and we move and we have our being. You're with us in our homes right now as we listen to this or wherever we may be. You're attentive to our thoughts and our lives, our struggles, our, our joys. Lord, we thank you that you are our God and that you've called us to be your people and to live lives that reflect you, that honor you, that bring you glory throughout this world. And we confess, Father, that we have failed to do that well this week. We come here with many sins. We come here with the sin of self-righteousness, believing that we know best, believing that we aren't wrong. And Lord, we confess that we have failed to be humble. We have failed to seek forgiveness and to be repentant around the people that we love. We failed to do the things that you've asked us to do. And we have done many things that you've told us not to do. God, we bring our sins before you this morning and we ask that you would forgive us. That once again, you would apply your grace to our hearts and our lives and that you would transform us. God, we thank you that we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, that we are simultaneously perfect and yet sinners. And Lord, we pray that more and more we would die to sin and live to righteousness. Father, we also want to pray for your kingdom to come. We want to pray not only would your kingdom come in our lives, so that we reflect your glory to the world. But we want to pray that your kingdom would come in our city. God, we know that this place does not reflect your kingdom the way it should. That we don't love the things that you love and hate the things that you hate. And so we ask, God, that you would do that work here. Lord, that we would love the poor Lord, that we would be merciful people. God, that we would have compassionate hearts, that we would love our neighbors more than ourselves, that we would care about their needs more than our own. Father, we pray that as that takes place, we would see transformation, that Mooresville and the surrounding cities and towns would be known for the way that it loves and serves you. And Father, at this time, we also want to lift up our needs. We pray for those among us who are sick. Lord, we ask that you would heal them. We pray for those who are in places of financial strain and stress and difficulty. And ask, Lord, that you would give them faith to trust in you. And also that you would provide for their needs. Lord, I pray that we as a church would provide for one another so that we could be like your church in the New Testament where you say there should be no need among us. God, I pray that you would be with those who are lonely and despairing and depressed. This pandemic has been hard on everyone. Many of us feel stuck. We pray for your comfort. We pray for your nearness to them. We pray for those who are experiencing relational 
challenges, strained marriages, friendships. God, would you bring reconciliation? Would you lead us to forgive one another? Lord, we pray for unity in your church. God, we pray for a spirit of humility and repentance, Lord, that we would be in lockstep with you, following your mission, bringing the gospel to this place. Lord, we need you. We pray for revival in our church. God, we ask that you would bring new people here. And not just new people who are are looking for churches. We're thankful for them, Lord, but we pray that you would bring people who don't know you, to faith. We pray for baptisms. Lord, we pray for uh, revitalization. We pray for these events that are taking place on our, our campus. And we ask, Lord, that you would build new relationships and give us the opportunity to share your great love with the world around us. God, we're grateful and we trust that you will do these things. And we pray them in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. We're not going to collect our tithes and offerings. Um, There are a few ways that you can give. Uh, You can send checks in physically uh, to the church. You can bring them here and drop them off, or you can mail them to the church. The address is 129 Center Church Road, Mooresville, North Carolina. Um, And of course, we do have online giving available as well. You can go to thecenterchurch.org and click the Give button. I want to make a point here to say this is a continuation of worship. It's not the time where we break to to pay for the services that we're putting on, but uh, Scripture tells us that this is a moment where we get to give back. Uh, It's a sign that that we believe God has given us everything that we have, and as a result, we give Him the first fruits. We give Him the best parts of what He has given us. Um, And that will go, and it will support the mission of this church. It will support the work that we do in this community. Um, And it will also give us freedom uh, from one of our culture's greatest idols, which is wealth and money. So with that said, let's collect our tithes and offerings.
This morning, as we continue in our series in Nehemiah, uh, we're talking about reclaiming the promises of God. And in the book of Nehemiah, the Jews had been in exile uh, because they had sinned against the Lord. And the Lord had warned them back in Deuteronomy that that uh, in the book of Deuteronomy earlier through Moses, that if they ever turned away from the Lord, the Lord would remove them from the land and send them into exile. Their enemies would overcome them. And yet through Jeremiah and other prophets, there was the hope that if the people turned back to God, repented of their sins, that God would gather them back to the promised land. And so Nehemiah, knowing that promise along with Ezra, who was a, a, a priest, uh, had labored uh, to make that possible. And God began to open doors for the Jews to return to the promised land. Ezra had already gone before Nehemiah's account and established the worship of the temple so that the temple was rebuilt and the worship of God was continuing. But in the beginning of chapter one of Nehemiah, we find out that though all of that had transpired, the people who still lived in the land and those who had returned from exile, thanks be to their God, were still living with shame and great difficulty because the walls of Jerusalem were still torn down and their protection, their identity was in, in danger. And so as we have read in chapters one and two, we have begun to discover what it takes to reclaim God's promises in our life when, when we have gone astray or have missed the mark of what God has called us to be and to do as Christians, as disciples of Jesus Christ. Last week we saw about the obstacles that Nehemiah faced and how we as Christians have obstacles as we follow the Lord and love him and serve him. Well, this morning we're reading from chapter three and I'm only gonna read a, a couple of verses for you this morning but you should read the entire chapter. You should take the time to remember that this whole chapter is, a, is a, a recording of those who were then inspired to believe God and begin to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Hear now the word of God as we read in chapter three, verse one. Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section. Zakur, son of Emery, built the next, next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassaniah, and they laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Merimoth, son of Uriah and son of Hakaz, repaired the next section. Next to him, Meshulam, son of Berekah, the son of Meshzabel, made repairs. And next to him, Zadok, son of Ben'ana, also made repairs. And next to the section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. You know, one of the things that's amazing to me is you and I begin to think about this whole process of rebuilding or reclaiming the promises of God one of the things that we find in chapter three is that Nehemiah was leading a people into uh, reclaiming God's promises by rebuilding the city walls of that particular city called Jerusalem. And so in preparing for that whole business of creating these boundaries that were needful for their protection, Nehemiah began to honor God's order in trusting that God was going to use him to accomplish this. And he approached the king with permission to do so. And then he began to make personal sacrifices in order to ensure that the work would begin by going to Jerusalem and organizing the people. And then he went through the city and made a, uh, an assessment of what real damage there was. He had to assess what it was that needed to be rebuilt and reclaimed 
And then he began to enlist the aids of others and there prepare for opposition, which would come. This morning, as we look at this city of Jerusalem, it is mentioned in the Bible 818 times. And so as you and I begin to think of the city of Jerusalem in the Bible, we are taught that this city is special in God's economy, not just in Nehemiah's day, but in the economy of the Christian faith, because the Bible teaches us that there'll be a new Jerusalem that will come down from heaven and it will be the great city of our God. And when Christ establishes his reign upon the earth, he will reign from Jerusalem and all nations will bow down and worship him. And so it's not surprising then as we look at that city of Jerusalem and we understand its significance in Nehemiah's time as well as ours, that we first remember it was a city of peace. That's what the name means, Jerusalem. You find it named Salem, Jebus in, in Judges, the city of David who was its king. It was also called Zion and Moriah, the city of God, Ariel, it was also named the, the Yahweh is there. And finally, in Revelations 21, 2, you hear the new Jerusalem, meaning that eternal city that will be established, that all the other endeavors of living in that city were simply a model, a, a foretaste of what is to come. But as Nehemiah is beginning to rebuild this city, as he's beginning to reclaim the promises of God, he organizes these people to do this in such a way that really there are four different sections that he has to take on building, which would be an impossible job even in his day and for his people. It, the impossibility was there because of the scope, the immense amount of work that would have to be done in order to reclaim God's promise of establishing once again the city of God. There would be the north, northeast section in chapters, chapters 3, 1 through 7 that would have to be designated and, and it would involve not just the nobles, but it would involve the common workers as well. Artisans who dealt not just with brick and mortar, but even a perfumer who would sell their goods in markets. It would involve a western section that would involve including people who were just not only priests, but, but also paupers people who lived inside the city and out, as well as the southern section and the eastern section. But most importantly, as these walls were being vital to the, to the future of these people, though the walls themselves would be used as a way of identifying who they are as the people of God, it was the gates that became the most important part of the city. They were named according to their use and their importance in the economy of the, of the day. There was the sheep gate in verse 1, the fish gate in verse 3. You, you can immediately net, notice that they are called those gates because that's where you would go buy sheep or fish. There would be the old gate, the valley gate, the dung gate, the fountain gate, the water gate, the horse gate, the east gate, the inspection gate. All of these gates, all of these walls, these boundaries would be vital and important for the economy of the city. Well, what difference was that make in your life this morning? Well, it's simply this. If you are going to reclaim God's promises, then there must be some boundaries that you have as a follower of Christ. And just like walls define a country, just as borders define a people, so boundaries define us as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ. And so when you think of the boundaries and great gates, the first thing you and I learn from this chapter is that these boundaries, these walls, were going to define who is in the kingdom of God and who is not. When you and I begin to think about boundaries in our marriage, in our life, in our, in our work, we have to be able to distinguish between what I am responsible for and what others are responsible for. And so as a, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm not responsible to you, nor are you responsible to me for your walk with Christ. You are responsible to the Lord. But together we are called to build up the kingdom of God. Together we are to labor for the Lord in 
following the boundaries that he has laid for us as his disciples. So when you and I begin to think about that whole endeavor of following Christ, of making sure we have the boundaries clear, we have to begin to ask ourselves, what am I responsible for? The Lord said the first thing that you and I are responsible for is to love him. I think it's amazing that the whole book of the Old Testament is a story of God's love for his people. That God loves you. But that love is not given by God for you to live any way you want. This is why we go back to the law of God because there we begin to discover the boundaries that Christ now desires that you listen to, that you begin to incorporate and follow, not because you're trying to earn your salvation, but because you love God. And so when God says you shall have no other gods before you, what he is desiring is that you would love him with such intensity that you would not allow anything else to displace your devotion, your seeking of him, your loving of him, your serving him. And this is exactly what had happened to the Jews of the time of Nehemiah. They had lost their love for God. And because they had lost their love for God, the boundaries of their lives were broken down. The walls of their city were destroyed because they were living beyond the boundaries that God had given them. The other thing about boundaries that are important is it not only defines who I am and what I'm responsible for, it also allows me to allow others to be responsible for their own lives. In other words, because I know I am to love God with all my heart, soul, and mind and strength, I cannot make you, nor should I expect you to listen to me, that somehow I can force you to love God. You see, that's your boundary. You must decide how you live in these days that God has given you. The most interesting part about the passage that we're reading this morning is the importance not only of the walls in defining the people of God, the boundaries that they are given to live in. The other thing that is astounding is the gates. Because it is the gates of the cities that would always allow the people to let in the good and let out the bad. Well, what is the significance of that? Well, Jesus said that for those of them who would follow him, they would have to repent of their sins and believe in him. And so when you and I begin about thinking about letting in the good, when you and I begin to draw the boundaries of following Jesus Christ, of reclaiming the promises of God, those promises are given to us as God's gift as we seek the Lord as we begin to live by his word. This is why Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I, I am the sheep of, the, of, the, of the, the flock. I am the gate. He was pointing to that whole premise that, that it is through Christ that we obtain and we are satisfied in knowing God because God has made that available through Jesus Christ to us. And so as we love the Lord as we serve him. One of the commandments that Jesus talked about over and over again is people will know you love me by the way you keep my commandments. Again, we are saved by our repentance and faith in the work of the cross. We are made acceptable by what Christ did for us when he died on the cross. But beyond that, now that we know him and we have come to become uh, believers in Jesus Christ, God now gives us boundaries that he asks us to follow out of love for him. This is where Nehemiah realized the importance of the walls of Jerusalem. Because without building those boundaries in their lives, without those walls and those gates, they would never be able to be identifying themselves and understand their position before God. The walls were protection, not only against their enemies, it brought definition to their lives as to who was in the city and who was out, who belonged and who didn't. But 
It also brought the whole realization that to reclaim the promises of God meant they not only had to identify as the people of God once again, they had to begin to live as the people of God. And here is where the rub for us really becomes very strong. If I say I love Christ, but don't bother to obey Him, to seek His will, to love Him, then do I really love Jesus? Faith is one of those slippery things in life that never is static. It never comes to a place where it just arrives and it stays at a certain level. Faith in God is always something that is either increasing or decreasing in our life. And our faith is not that God exists. We know that to be true. Our faith is that we believe his word to be true and we follow it. And so in our day of 2020, the culture we live in is a culture where we're challenged continually. Will I love God and do what he says? Or will I do what pleases other people? Once I set up the boundary, then I know the difference between the two. Once I understand what God expects of me, once I take time to read Christ's words and begin to follow it, I begin to build walls and gates that allow the good in and the bad out. And so this morning, you may be involved with something where you know what you're doing isn't loving God and you feel shame and you feel remorse, but there's something within you that doesn't want to let it go. You need a boundary. You can't change this because you want to. You need someone greater than you to come into your heart and to cause you to love Christ more than whatever it is that you are clinging to. It could be a relationship where you're living outside of what God's will is. It could be a business transaction where you know you're not being honest and forthright. It could be a number of different places where, where you're not being completely honest or transparent in such ways that you are deceiving or, or leading people astray. None of this pleases God. And to reclaim God's promise for us means that we begin to draw the boundaries that we're going to please God and love Him before anyone else, above anything else. This was the only way God would restore their nation. You see, the reason they had lost their nation was they had lost their love for God. And the only way they could re regain it was to return to their first love. This morning in in your time of worship, you may be thinking, how do I grow in my love for God? How do I grow in my faith? How do I become stronger? And the answer is simply complex. It's simple in that Christ is the answer to our problem. The complexity is, are you willing to turn away from whatever robs him of your love? This is the teaching we have from the first commandment of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. Is there anything in your life this morning that you love more than God? Would you be willing to give it up? To love Him? This is the first and vital step for anyone who would pursue God. 
to know him, to walk with him. Would you pray with me? Our gracious God and our Father, as we come into your presence, we want to acknowledge that we live in a, a tumultuous time where we are tempted on all sides by all kinds of things that would ask for our allegiance or attention. I might be in a relationship where I, I feel such devotion and love to someone that I am more concerned about pleasing them than I am in pleasing you. I could be in a situation at work where, where I am tempted, Father, to transgress what I know is right because I, I want to be accepted by others. I want to be included with the group. I don't want to be different from others in the sense that I want to fit in. And yet, oh Father, in my heart of hearts, I know that to love you is the better way. To follow you is the better path. However I am tempted or torn, I thank you, O oh God, that you have not left us alone, but that you have given us your Holy Spirit to guide and direct us, that today, as we hear the words, this is the day the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad. It is a day you have given for us to love you and serve you. And the more we love you, the more we choose to obey your commandments, the more we follow your word, the richer our lives become and the more vibrant we feel in living on our days. And for that reason, we pray, O oh God, Help us to build the boundaries and the gates that will honor you and will identify us to the world as believers in Jesus Christ. For this we ask and we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. And the people of God said together, Amen.
Won't you receive now um, the benediction as we leave our service and go back into the world that we have been given to serve God? I charge you to remember those words that Jesus gave to his first disciples when he said, Come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. May you find immense success in loving God this week. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm.